so good to see y'all today, and what an honor it is for me to get to stand here today and to bring the word to you this morning. Uh, are you ready to receive today? Have you come ready to receive? Why don't we bow our heads? I believe the Lord has given me a message for this church today and for you, and I pray that you'll open your heart and you will receive it. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, we're just so grateful to be in your house. We're grateful to be in your presence. And Lord, I pray today that you would just anoint my words, what you've given me to speak to this church today, Father. I just pray, God, that you will use my life today, God, to minister. Lord, I pray that we will open our heart and that the word of God would get inside of us and dwell richly within us, God. And it would make a difference at our tables. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to my table. <laughs> the th- the uh, series this month is Bring It to the Table. Pastor Bob uh, kicked this off last week, and he did such a phenomenal job. We'll get to that in just a minute. But this is my table this morning. And I thought, well, I wanted you to see whenever we all gather, who gathers at my table. And so I've got uh, Barry and I are on the table. We've got, our, we've got our sons, Jacob, Jonathan, Jeremy, their families. I've got my fr- five grandbabies. How many of you know those are the most important people on this table, the grandkids? And then I've got, I've been so blessed. Uh, I have got a wonderful mom and dad. I've got my grandparents. Uh, I've got a Beautiful mother in love right here, Miss Shirley and, and Paul Paul, uh, her husband, Ralph. Uh, we've got Granny, Barry's Granny. I've got my papa is here, my grandmother and brother Blythe. I mean, I've got, there's stories on this table. This is a fun bunch of people, I want to tell you. And when we would all get together, some of them's in heaven, but when we would all get together, it was rowdy. It was loud. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. I remember growing up. At, uh, at this table, my mom and dad's table. My sister's not on the table, but uh, I have a sister. But I remember growing up around the table. And I'm going to tell you, those were back in the good old days when we didn't know that lard would kill you. Or, uh, or, you know, cook or fry and everything. And my mama was a cook. Let me tell you, she still is. But I mean, oh my goodness. We had fried chicken, fried pork chops, fried fish, hush puppies, french fries. Anything we could fry, we fried. And we, she makes the best pot roast. I mean, she could put it on the table. It was so good. Uh, wasn't too long till my sister's boyfriend started showing up at the table. And then my boyfriend started showing up at the table. That guy right there. And uh, every night at 6 o'clock, they would come. I think they came for Mama's cooking. It was not me and my sister. It was my Mama's cooking. But, uh, oh, the fun times we had at the table. We would, we would uh, laugh. We would play games at the table. We, the pastor would come to our table. The church people would come to our table. We loved our church family. They were family. Missionaries would come. My mom would invite missionaries. And, oh, the impartation that, that got into my spirit as a young girl at the table. Pastor Bob talked last week about the table being a significant place. And, oh, it has been in my life. Do you know how important the table is? It is scientifically proven that if you eat together as a family, if you have children, your children will do better in school. That they will be less likely to do drugs or to have a a teen pregnancy. That uh, your confidence uh, will expand if you sit at a table. You'll learn how to have better conversation. You, I don't know about your table, but I learned manners at my table. Manners were very important. You did not put your elbows on the table. And uh, you, you, cu- you used your silverware. And, of course, you knew, Pastor Bob talked about that. You know what every fork and knife and spoon is for at the table and which cup. So you learn a lot at a table. But I just want you to see my table this morning. But um, Pastor Bob shared last week, I thought this was neat. He said, in the King James Version, there are 73 references to a table in Scripture. And I thought, wow, that's, that's incredible because you do know people have been eating since Adam and Eve. So <laughs> you know there's tables. There's tables. Um, he talked about how a, a table can be a sentimental place. See, I brought my people. These are my people here. Yeah. And y'all are my people because you're my church family, okay? But I brought my people here so you would think about your table, about your family. See, Pastor Bob in this series... He wants you to think about your life. He wants you to think about your family. He wants you to make sure you're living intentionally 
with your family. How many of you know we only have a certain amount of time down here to make an impartation? He talked about a table can hold sentimental value. And then he said a table can be a segregated place. He talked about, you know, you may have somebody at your table that's just barely saved. You may have somebody at your table that isn't saved at all. You may have somebody at your table that thinks they're super saved. <laughs> you know, and he talked about that, and I thought, you know, that's something to think about. Are you living intentionally? See, this is more, about, this is more than just talking about a table. Do y'all get this? This is talking about your life and how you live your life in front of your family, in front of your church family, in front of the people you work with. Are you living intentionally? Uh, a table ought to be a site that stimulates safety and support. Pastor, Pastor Rob talked about this last week. Uh, and he said, look for opportunities. Look for opportunities to show kindness at the table. Do we do that? What stops you from being a blessing? That was the question he asked us last week. Let me ask you, let me tell you this. If there's something that is stopping you from being a blessing, can I just encourage you to go to your prayer closet? <laughs> Get that right before you get to the table. Because I want to tell you something. By the end of this service, I hope you see how important this table is. This table is so important because lives are eternal. They're either going to live in heaven with you one day or they're going to live in hell. It's important that we establish the value of our tables. Now, here's the deal. We live our lives and we think that we're always going to be at the table. We think we're, we think we're going to, I bet y'all think you're going to be at your Thanksgiving table in a week or so. I hope I am. I believe I am. You're probably thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm already making plans for my Christmas table. You never know. We don't know if we're going to be here tomorrow. We don't know. I've got people on my table now that they're in heaven. My daddy is in heaven. Uh, my grandmother is in heaven. My papa is in heaven. My grandmother's second husband, Brother Blythe, who we love dearly, he's in heaven now. Uh, my father-in-law, Paul Paul, he's in heaven. Oh, we miss him. <laughs> granny, Barry's granny, uh, my, uh, Shirley's mama, she's in heaven. Listen, this woman can make chicken and dumplings. <laughs> and, and grandmother, oh my goodness, her breakfasts are awesome. And Oh my goodness, yes. And so we've got some of our family members... The seat's going to be vacant, and they're always vacant at our table. Oh, we always miss them at our table. There may be a, a seat vacant this year at your table. Maybe somebody went to heaven. Maybe somebody went into eternity. But you know what? One day, my seat's going to be vacant. One day, your seat's going to be vacant, and that's okay. That's life. We're not promised another breath. Look what James says. James says, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. James 4.14. On the screen. We got it? There we go. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We don't know. We've not been promised another day. And so knowing that, listen, this should compel us to live our life with intentionality, right? Do you know you're needed at the table? Your presence is needed at this table. We got to live with intentionality because too much is at stake. Now, about a month ago, Pastor Bob asked this question. He said, this is what the series is going to be, and here's the question. <laughs> he said... I want you to, and I want you to answer this question this morning in your mind. I want you to put the question up there for me. If this would be the last time that you would come to this table, what would you want to communicate to your family? Now, I want you to take a screenshot of that with your phone. Write it down because I want you to think about this. How many of you came to church today to get an impartation or to learn or to get something? Okay, write it down. <laughs> Take a picture. I want you to think about this question throughout this message. I want you to think about this question. If this would be the last time that you would come to the table for the holidays, what would you want to communicate to your family? What would you say? And then whatever that is, think about it. And then whatever that is, 
that you would say, this is what I'd want to communicate to my family. Whatever that is, then let me tell you what you need to do. You need to start living intentionally and focusing on that right there every day of your life with your family, with your church family, with every, everywhere you go, but especially these that you are accountable to. What is that thing? Whatever that is, that's your clue. That's your greatest gift right now. Whatever that is, think about this. What do, you, what do you want your life to say? What do you want to say to your loved ones? Give intentionality to it. I'm not, I'm not necessarily recommending that you give a speech at the table over, over the turkey, okay? <laughs> I don't want you to be a downer at the table. But I am telling you, it's important what you communicate to your family, whatever that question is going to be. Impart that into your family. See, you've you got to think about life. You need to impart before you depart. We didn't know that Papa was going to leave us and go to heaven. We had no clue. He just went like that. We sort of knew my dad was going, but we wasn't real sure the time or anything. But we had time with, with Daddy. We've, got, we've had precious people. But guess what? When they departed, they had done a good job. There was nothing left to say. You know, Pastor Bob talked about his mom last week, and she said that this table is the heart of the family. I love that. And uh, so I asked my mom a couple of weeks ago, I said, Mom, this is the question. What would you say? What would you say if this was the last time you would come to the table? What, would, what is it that you would say? And this is what my mom said. She said, I don't know what I would say. If I haven't said it already with my life, What's left to say? And I thought, well, that'll preach. If I haven't said it already with my life, my mother's 85 years old. She said, I don't know what I'd say. If I haven't already said it with my life, what's left to say? See, your family knows you. They're watching you. They know you. <laughs> Have you imparted into them? What are you imparting into them? We need to think about it. See, in one sense, you've already told them by the way you've lived in your life. Are you, are you living life the right way? Do you need to make some changes? It's a great opportunity for you. Every time you gather with your family to impart into them. See, we've got to learn to impart before we depart. You don't know when you're going to depart. We've got to impart. And, you know, I was thinking about this, this question Pastor Bob said. What would you communicate to your family if you knew it was your last time? Do you know that Jesus had the opportunity to answer that question at a table? He had this opportunity to say some of his last words with his disciples. And interestingly enough, you read it, it was at a table. The 12 disciples were present. The meal had been prepared. The food was on the table. Let's look what Jesus said in Luke twenty two fifteen. 15. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He said, I have desired to be with you. Do we love our family enough? Do we, does, our, does our heart long after their souls enough that we fervently desire to be with them? See, Jesus was getting ready. He was getting ready to go and be scourged and be beaten. He was going to go be on trial. He was going to be nailed to a cross. He's sitting at the table. He's sitting at the table. He's going to die for them. He's going to die for the world. And he said, it's been my desire that I am at this table with you. <laughs> In John chapter 13 through chapter 17, it's Jesus' final message to his disciples. If you want to know everything Jesus said at this table to his disciples, you need to read John 13, 14, 15, and 16. And you will be able to hear everything he spoke at this table. 
And then he concluded it in John 17 when he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for them. And I believe that we can learn from what we hear him saying in the gospel. I think we can learn some things today about how to, how to impart. Look at John 13, verse 1 through 3. Jesus is speaking in this, and uh, he's talking about the Lord. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Oh, isn't that beautiful? He loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. He knew where he was going. Jesus, is, Jesus knew his time on earth was quickly coming to an end. He knew that his hour had come. John 13, 1, he said he knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. It's what the scripture, we just read it. Uh, he knew that there were some things he wanted to communicate with those that he loved because his hour had come. Isn't it interesting that for those three and a half years, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious people, they were wanting to make sure his hour came immediately. They tried to stone him. They wanted to stone him. They tried one time, to, they were going to throw him off a cliff and Jesus hid himself and, and got away. But they hated him. They despised him because he healed on the Sabbath and because he did all these things. And, but Jesus endured it all and Jesus knew his time had not come yet. Um, it was not his time to depart. His work was not completed. I love what... I read Warren Worsby made this statement. He said this, the quote, he said, When the servant of God is in the will of God, he is immortal until his work is done. See, Jesus was on a heavenly time clock. He's not, he was not on an earthly time clock. He was in the perfect will of his Father, and his hour had not come until he sat at the table. And he said, My hour has come. See, Jesus, number one, Jesus loved them. What did Jesus do at this table? What can we learn from Jesus? Jesus is our example. Jesus loved them. Were they perfect? <laughs> you read the Gospels. They were, they were not perfect. Before this meal is over, they are battling to see who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There was competition between them. They weren't perfect. Did Jesus know that? Yes, he knew it. He loved them. You've got all kinds of a variety of wonderful people at your table. You say, oh, you don't know my family. Listen, God loves them. We must love them. Jesus loved them. He loved them all. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Can I tell you, love your family. This is a real simple message. Love your family. And not just your blood family. Love your church family. Do you love your, you're going to spend eternity with your church family. You know, there may be some people on your table that they're not born again. You may not be able to spend eternity with them. But you've got to love them. You're going to love your church family as well. But we've got to love. Jesus taught us to love. Love is a powerful force. <laughs> you know, sitting here at the table. I guess Jesus felt like he really needed to implement a new com commandment for all these guys. <laughs> Because he knew they were just like us. Look what he said in John 13, 34 and 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. Jesus at this table made a new commandment. Love each other. Guys, you got to love each other. Can I say, guys, you got to love each other? I would love to say to my whole family, we got to love each other. We're all very different. we got different personalities. Some may rub you a little wrong. Get the flesh out of you. <laughs> Tell your flesh to shut up. Love. Love covers a multitude of sins, right? Look what 1 John 3, 14 says. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. How do you know you're born again? Because you love each other. He, do, he who does not love his brother abides in death. 
1 John 3, 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know how you know somebody really loves you? It's not all just words. They're going to show you. They're going to demonstrate their love. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who loves God, who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Love is not a suggestion. Jesus was not suggesting they love. Jesus was commanding they love. It's not conditional. And can I tell you where this love begins? It begins in your home. Don't walk in here and try to love on everybody else if you can't love on the people inside the four walls of your house. That is good preaching. Yes, amen. Okay. I'll just keep going. All right. Do you bring, what do you bring to the table? Pastor Bob kept saying, what do you bring to the table? What do you bring to the table? Do you bring love? Do people want to be with you? Do you know why Jesus was invited to the wedding? I think because people loved him. They wanted him at their party. Why did they follow Jesus? Oh, they could feel the love of God in him. Something was different. People ought to love you at your table. If they don't, there's something wrong. See, love sees the other person. Love really sees. Love cares about the needs of others. Jesus is our example. Jesus went after those that needed a Savior. He loved them. He went after the Samaritan woman who was at the well in John 4, 27. We see the love of Jesus forgiving the immoral woman in Luke chapter 7, you know, where she poured the fragrant oil on his feet and wiped them with, his, with her hair. Jesus helped the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7 when, when the, her daughter needed help and, and he helped cast that demon out. He cast the demon out of the daughter. The love of Jesus compelled him to touch and heal the leper, my favorite. Oh my goodness. The leper said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I'm willing. And Jesus touched the unclean, the unlovable. He loved he loved. Jesus joined Zacchaeus for supper. He was an outcast. Nobody loved Zacchaeus. Nobody. That was in Luke 19. But Jesus saw people that needed a Savior. He saw hurting people. His, his love embraced the outcast. He came to save and to rescue lost sinners. Jesus never condemns. I want you to hear me in love. Listen, Jesus never points the finger and condemns anybody. He doesn't do that. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Listen, if Jesus does not point the finger and condemn, you need to put your finger down. Quit condemning people. That's the devil's job. That's what Satan does. He's the accuser of the brethren. Quit accusing and quit condemning. Don't do that to people at your table. You're going you're to wound them for, for eternity. Love them. Love them in truth. I love what Pastor Bob said last week. It's so, so balanced. He said, there's going to be things at the table where you'll need to speak truth. But make sure you speak it in love. See, when you really love somebody, you're going to speak truth. But you're not going to condemn them. Jesus didn't condemn the woman. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He spoke love and truth. <laughs> Jesus does not point the finger of condemnation and neither should we. Love saves. Love never condemns. Be careful. Jesus loved with compassion. He loved with, with mercy. Think, stop and think about your table. Stop and think about your table. Now can I say something? This is just the mother in me. I just want to say it. Uh, are you that person at the table that talks about yourself all the time and you manipulate, you, you control the whole conversation because you're talking about yourself all the time? Nobody in here. It's those people online I'm talking to. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, can you just stop talking about yourself for just a minute and inquire about somebody else? 
Can you just see the hurt that sits around this table? People are hurting today, y'all. Your family's hurting. Your church family's hurting. Do you, do you just walk right past them? What do we say here? Walk through the crowd slowly. See as Jesus see. Care, do you really care about people? See, love reaches. <laughs> love sees. Love reaches. Love connects. Loves, love embraces. Love sacrifices. Be, don't be so self-focused. Be like Jesus. And another thing. There's so much hate in this world. <laughs> You just can't write people off. We live in a society now that just discounts people, erases people, writes people off. Don't do that at this table. John 4.20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Don't write people off. God's not done with them. Keep praying for them. Love them. Love them. My grandpa Abrams, my grandma, my grandma's daddy, Grandpa Abrams, lived out in Colorado on the prairie. He was running for county clerk on the Republican ticket. And he hated the woman running against him. She was on the Democratic ticket. And he hated her. Her name was Mrs. Hines. And he wasn't saved. Grandpa wasn't saved. And Grandpa had five daughters. Grandma was his oldest girl. And they all went to church, but Grandpa one Sunday went to church, and he got gloriously saved. And he went to the altar, and he cried his way through. He wept his way through to salvation. And the love of God came in and filled his heart. And he stood up from that altar, and he threw his arms up, and he said, I just love everybody. And one of his daughters said in front of the whole church, Do you love Mrs. Hines? And Mrs. Hines was sitting in the congregation. And Grandpa, with tears running down his eyes, opened his arms and he said, Yes, I love Mrs. Hines. They embraced. See, love will drive hate out. We don't have, we don't have room. We don't have time to hate, y'all. We need a baptism of love. We need to let the Holy Spirit come in and change our hearts. You're ne- Do you want your family in heaven? <laughs> what would, would your family say you love? Jesus loved people. Oh, my goodness. How many times did Jesus sit down at this table with sinners? Oh, my. Do you know Matthew? When Jesus called Matthew, look at what it says in Matthew 9, verse 10. Now, it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house. Jesus is sitting at the table. What happened? Oh, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Oh, my. That just drove the religious people nuts. But they came. Why did they come? Why did Jesus sit with sinners? Jesus Jesus didn't sin with them. The reason Jesus sat with them was not to sin with them, but to show them the love of the Father and to lift them out of their sin and bring them to God. He didn't sit to sin with them. So don't think you can do that. You're not Jesus, okay? You can't do that. But he showed them the Father's love. Jesus met people where they were. We don't do a good job at that. Let me just say that, by the way. We don't always do that well. But Jesus met people right where they were. Jesus didn't say, now you got to change before you come and sit at this table. Jesus didn't do that. See, you can't change. Jesus knows people can't. We can't change on our own. But inviting Jesus to your table will change your life forever. Because change comes when you invite Christ into your life. (laughs) See, God works from the inside out. Amen. Romans 4, 2 says, this is so good. Listen, y'all, it's so important how we... We are with people. The Bible says that the goodness of God leads to repentance. Jesus sat down and showed them the Father and the goodness of the Father. And it led them to repentance. Do you bring God to the table? Or are you bringing your flesh? 
See, he was ridiculed by the religious people for associating with sinners. Matthew 9, 11 through 13 tells us that. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Do you bring love to your table? Is there enough of the love of God in you that it's drawing your family to the Lord? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw all men. What are you lifting up at the table? He loved them. Second thing, he served them. He's our example. He served them. Because he loved them, he served them. John 13, 2. And as and supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper. Listen to this. Read this. Can you sing? He rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Look at verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. He humbled himself. Deity bowed low. Deity took the towel and served. What humility. The sovereign God took the role of a servant. The God of the universe, the one who created all things, the Lord, the master, he served. Imagine the Lord of heaven and earth washing feet. What? What? Did I read that right? Surely not. The God of heaven... He bent low? He took the towel? No. No, I'm not reading that right. The God of heaven, he served, he bent, he washed. He did a servant's task. (laughs) What a lesson we learn from our Lord. He stooped low. He served. He wasn't prideful. He didn't say, I didn't come to wash feet. Did you hear him say that in the text? He didn't say that. He served. Pastor Bob has spent several weeks inviting this church to serve. And given opportunity. He's given the call. He's invited each one of us to be a blessing in this church, not just at home. Now I'm not I'm talking now about the whole family. To serve. Yes, you serve your family. Serve your church family. He's given the invitation. Will you serve? Some have accepted the invitation. And I'm going to tell you, it's the most beautiful thing that's going to be in your life. God's going to honor you. You're going to be rewarded. There's rewards in serving. It takes a humble heart to serve others. Listen to me. It takes a heart of grace to bow low. There's a melee proverb. It's on the screen. It says, The fuller the ear is of rice grain, the lower it bends. Can you bend? Matthew 23, 11, Jesus said, But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus taught us that a servant is not above his master. He gave us the example to follow. Real joy comes from serving others. Peter tells us that each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. What's your gift? Are you using it? Are you serving? 
What do you bring to the table? Love is not just saying I love you. Love is demonstrating your love. I'm so glad whenever humanity was lost in, in sin and there was no hope that God didn't, didn't just shout down from heaven, hey, I love y'all down there. Hope it works out for you. He didn't do that. God didn't do that. He came himself. He bent low. He emptied himself. Serve your family. Serve your spouse. Serve your children. Do you serve your family? What would your, fa would your family say that you serve? Are you the chief servant in your house? I know a couple. I have two children. Precious couple. It is their, it is their motto every day. The husband and wife. That they outserve the other one. Who can serve the other one the greatest that day? Do you think maybe they have a good marriage? You think maybe they have a happy home? You think maybe their lives are blessed? They're just looking for ways to serve each other. See, serving is a mark of affection. That's why a family table can be so sweet. The fuller the ear is of rice grain, the lower it bends. I love that proverb. I have to think the fuller that we are of Jesus and his word, the fuller we are of his spirit and his fruit, the lower we're going to bend to serve. Jesus stooped low. <laughs> he was full of the Spirit. He was caught in the flesh. The fuller you are of God, you're going to serve. Mm. Jesus told him what was to come. And this is the last. He was leaving. Because he loved them, he prepared them. They were so troubled. Could you imagine sitting around that table and Jesus is telling them, my hour's come and I'm going now. Oh my goodness, they were so troubled. But you read, you read John. You read the gospel of what Jesus said to them. He said in John 14, 1 through 6, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, oh, Thomas was so troubled. Listen to what Thomas said. Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What was Jesus saying? It's going to be okay. I'm, going to I'm comforting you. It's going to be okay. He comforted them. Wow, you, you look in Scripture. He said so many beautiful things right before he left. He said, and I will pray the Father, and he's going to give you another helper. He's going to abide with you forever. He promised that there's going to be a comforter that was going to come. He talked to him. He said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. He said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And then he says, peace. I'm going to leave you my peace. Not as the world gives. I'm going to give you my peace. He said, don't be afraid. Come on up if you want to. Here's some of the statements I mean, you read these four chapters, it's going to touch your heart. Jesus sits here at the, at the table and he says, Listen, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he's going to give it to you. And then he, he warns them. He tells them what's to come. He said, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're also going to persecute you. Keep reading. It's so, it's so beautiful. When you read these chapters, he intersperses all the time. But the comforter, the comforter's coming. <laughs> he said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. You're not left alone. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you, you can't bear them now. But when the comforter comes... He's going he's gonna to teach you all things. Oh, these are such beautiful verses. 
what Jesus said to his disciples, the last words he said to them before going to the cross, before dying. It's beautiful. Listen. <laughs> this table, it's very important. Your table is very important. <laughs> I thank God for my table. I thank God for my table. I thank God for all that my parents, my grandparents have poured in my life. The impartation that I have received sitting at a godly table. I thank God for this. I thank God for, for our family. Here's a picture of our family. I thank God for each and every one of them. Here's a picture of our connect group, the next one. See, the family of God. There's precious people at this table. They're my family. I love each one of these people dearly. I love them. Next picture. It's our pastoral staff. Pastor Bob treated us at a dinner. We were all at the table together, just having a great time. I, lo I love our church family. I love them. Tables are important. There's a lot of encouragement that goes on at a table, and a lot of love is imparted. And I think about all that Jesus shared at a table. I think about whether it was him eating with Matthew and what he imparted at that table when he ate with Zacchaeus. All the criticism he endured for eating with sinners. What about the time when he shared so many meals with Lazarus and Mary and Martha? Oh, don't you know those were sweet times of impartation at that table? How about the time when he turned the pasture into a table and fed 5,000 people. 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. What about the time he, he did it again and fed the 4,000? See, Jesus loved bringing people to a table. He loved bringing people together. All the time and all the energy that, that Jesus spent pouring his life into people was for one reason and for one purpose. It was to get them to this table. See, everything I do at this table, we're at a, we're at a season in our life, Barry and I, to where we know our days are numbered. <laughs> we don't have as many days ahead of us as we, have, we had behind us. And every time we're with these precious babies, <laughs> our precious grandkids and our, our family, it's for one purpose, the love, the impartation. We want to be full of God every time we're with them because we want to get them to that table. There's another table for the people of God. There's another table that's awaiting you. And that this table is not for everyone. It's just for those that have accepted the invitation. The invitation goes out to everyone. The invitation is for everyone. But not everybody's going to be at that table. That's why this weighs heavy. Your life weighs heavy. God needs you at this table. Praise God. There's another table gathering you must not miss. This table is of, is of utmost importance. This table is the invitation of a lifetime. You see, Jesus is the one that's extending the invitation. Who would turn Jesus down? <laughs> it's the table of the Lord. Every person who has accepted Christ as Savior, every person who has repented of their sins and made Christ the Lord of their life is going to be present at that table. Millions upon millions upon millions of blood-bought souls are going to be at that table. The entire family of God is going to be there. Oh, my goodness, my daddy is there. My papa's there. Granny's there. Papa's there. Grandma's there. Brother Bly's there. I've got an aunt there. I want to be there. I've already sent him RSVP. My, my name tag is already on the table. That's an important, that's an important invitation. You better, you better RSVP. You talk about a wedding table. That's a wedding table. <laughs> that's the day we're going to be married to Christ. And this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. You talk about a celebration. You've never known celebrations till you go to that table. Oh. 
Oh, my goodness. Jesus told his disciples at this last supper in Matthew 26, 29, he said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's going to pick up the glass and he's going to drink it. And we're going to be married to him. See, down here, you may miss an opportunity to be at the table. Down here, you may, you know, we're disappointed when we all can't gather. I mean, Jeremy is in Kansas City. He's, he's not at our Thanksgiving tables no more, nor our Christmas tables. And we're disappointed. My sister's in D.C. Um, there's obligations. There's circumstances sometimes. There's schedules. There's jobs that may hinder you from being at this table. You may miss the family meal. It brings sadness to our heart when our family is not all there. You may miss it due to sickness or work. Or maybe you avoid this table because there's strife at this table with somebody, another family member. Let me tell you something. you got to do whatever it takes. You can't miss that table. Do you hear me this morning? You cannot miss this table. You can't miss it. You've got to be there. The reason Jesus ate with sinners at this table was to lift them out of their sin to get them to that table. This morning, I believe... I really believe, I have felt it all week, that Jesus is knocking on heart's door. The scripture says, behold, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and and I will dine with him. He wants to dine with you and he with me. Listen, make it of utmost priority to be there. It's going to be the greatest event in your life, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be the greatest feast in the history of the world, and nothing can compare to this table. Look what John wrote in Revelation. The apostle John saw this table. Look what he says. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Have you made yourself ready? And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. How are you serving? It's going to reflect on what you're wearing. That's what the scripture says. How did you serve? It's going to be reflected in what you wear in heaven. This is a real, this is not a fairy tale. This is real. John said, Jesus said, this day's coming. John saw it. Make yourself ready. Jesus is knocking on the heart's door today. (laughs) Come and dine. Jesus is saying, come and dine. See, soon the lamb will take his bride to be ever at his side. All the host of heaven will assembled be oh twill be a glorious sight all the saints in spotless white and with Jesus they will feast eternally come and dine the master's calling come and dine I want all the heads bowed this morning in the presence of the Lord I don't want anybody moving right now Pastor Bob's intention with this is that we would be reflective about our life and the well-being of our family I want to ask you a question this morning this won't take but a minute but if you know beyond any shadow of any doubt if you know that you know that you know that you're going to be sitting at that table in heaven one day I want you to raise your hand you don't have a doubt I'm looking I'm looking keep your hands up I'm looking okay put your hands down If you're not sure, you say, Candy, I don't know. I'm struggling. I'm not even going to try to read your mail. I don't know what's going on in your life. But you say, you know what? I don't know, but I want to know. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Come on. This is serious business this morning. You say, I'm not sure I'm going to be there, but I want to be there. I got some things I got to take care of this morning in my heart. I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, I'm looking. You may say to me, I've got two more I want to say to you. The next one is, Candy, I need to be more intentional at my table. (laughs) I need to love better. 
the Lord, I need to serve better. I need help. I need, I, I want to do that. Raise your hand. If that's you, raise your hand. Yes, 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 yes. All right, put your hands down. How many of you say, Candy, there are people at my table in my family. They don't know Jesus. I need to pray. I want you to raise your hand. Okay, let's all stand. Let's all stand. The last thing Jesus did was he prayed. And he prayed for his disciples. And then he prayed for us. I want us to pray this morning. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. God, we give you glory today for what you've done in this house. I thank you, God, that you love us. Lord, I pray today that each one of us, each one that raised their hand today that said, I need to love more. I need to serve more. God, I pray that the love of God would be poured forth in our heart. God, I pray that we would have a, a new a new experience with you, Lord. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit afresh and new. God, we need, we need you to come and fill our lives, Lord, so that you will flow out of us to our family members and those around us. Now, God, we pray, we call the names out. Why don't you just call their name out, those that are unsaved. God, we call their names out to you. And God, we ask that you would remove the blinders from their eyes, that they would receive the light of the glorious gospel. God, time is short, and you said today is the day of salvation. And so, God, today we are calling upon you. We are carrying them to the throne today. We are laying them at your feet, and we are saying, Father God, please save our loved ones. Let their hearts be turned towards you today, God. Lord, let them make you the Lord of their life. God, let them see their need of a Savior. God, we want our whole family at that table in heaven one day. We thank you for it, Lord. Now, God, I pray that you would bless us as we go this morning. God, keep us, Lord. God, I pray, God, that we would live intentionally. And, God, I pray that you would help us to all answer that question and let that be our focus. And, Lord, that we would live for you all the days of our lives and we would bring all of our family with us, Lord, on that day. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's leave on three. Hallelujah. One, two, three. Hallelujah. God bless y'all. Thank y'all for being so attentive.